Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, TOPS. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Mike Pesco, a tobacco control researcher at Georgia State University. TOPS is organized by myself, C. Sheng from the Ohio State University, Justin White from University of California, San Francisco, and Catherine McLean from George Mason University. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, C. Shang from the Ohio State University to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Today, we continue our fall 2022 season with a single paper presented presentation by Aisha Baisalawa entitled Exploring Border Effects sensitivity of cigarette consumption to access tax. Aisha Baisalawa is a PhD candidate at the Center for Economic Research and Graduate Education, Economics Institute, Serge A. Her research focuses on tobacco access taxation. She's particularly interested in the assessment of how social outcomes from access taxes on cigarettes and alcohol are influenced by the heterogeneity of consumer responses with respect to quantity, intensity, and quality of access goods consumption. Her recent working paper investigate, uh, investigates the bias in the estimate of consumption sensitivity to an increase in access tax rate arising from tax avoidance uh, actions of consumers. Our discussion today is Catherine McLean, a tobacco researcher at George Mason University. Ms. Baisalawa, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, should I share my screen? Yes, please. Thank you. So, I will share my screen. Uh, so can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, okay. So thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm uh, Aisha Baisalova, as was mentioned, from uh, Center of Economic Research and Graduate Education. I will be presenting my uh, working paper, Exploring Body Effects, Sensitivity of Cigarette Consumption to Excise Tax. Uh, this study was supported by Charles University uh, GAUK project, uh, and I really want to thank uh, my supervisor Nicholas Mitak and Jan Hanusik for their valuable feedback and suggestions. Uh, this data, uh, this research uses uh, data like news and consumer data, which is provided by Kiel's Center for Marketing uh, Data Center at the University of Chicago Bull School of Business. I will start with the research question and then we will have a brief uh, literature overview. We will continue with the data description estimation strategy and estimation results. And finally, we will discuss robustness analysis. Uh, now let's start with the research question. And uh, as you probably noticed from the title that uh, we will discuss uh, cross-border purchasing and how cross-border purchasing affects a sensitivity of uh, um, consumption. So tax sensitivity of consumption. So tax avoidance opportunities can serve uh, as an important determinant or of a consumer's purchase decision uh, in response to an excise tax increase. And uh, cross-state purchasing in the nearest lower tax state uh, decreases the impact of excise tax policy measures. Ignoring these border effects leads to a biased estimate of the tax elasticity of consumption. And in this research, I used Nielsen Consumer Panel data where I estimate the bias arising from the border effects and investigate how sensitivity to cigarette excise tax and the size of bias vary for different demographic groups. I specifically concentrate on excise taxation of cigarettes in the US uh, because of this benefit, yes, because uh, I can track the variability of uh, state excise taxes across states. But now uh, let's probably 
look at the brief literature review and then at the data, which is quite amazing. So uh, regarding brief literature review, uh, we, we know that there are like numerous uh, various studies uh, which uh, investigate negative effect of excise tax increase on tobacco consumption. Uh, some of them are presented there. For example, Ali evaluates the effect uh, on cigarette consumption of a large increase in cigarette tax uh, using data from telephone survey. Uh, Koti et al. Uh, use actually the same uh, Nielsen consumer panel data, but for the years from 2011 to 2015, to investigate how tobacco control policies such as excise taxes and smoke-free laws uh, affect uh, purchases of cigarettes and electronic cigarettes. Uh, Pesca et al. also investigates from interesting angle uh, and investigates uh, cross-product elasticities. So uh, they find an evidence that uh, higher traditional cigarette tax rates reduce adult traditional cigarette use and increase adult e electronic cigarette use. Uh, however, it's also important to account for the fact that uh, tax sensitivity can be affected by possible tax avoidance actions of consumers, such as, for example, stockpiling if the future increase uh, of tax is known in advance, or cross-border purchasing in the nearest lower tax state. So this paper is mainly investigating cross-border cross, cross purchasing. Uh, we know that since consumer decision is determined by the final purchase price, imperfect tax pass through to prices may bias the estimate of tax sensitivity. So actually, when we observe a significant increase in tax, the price will not be probably reflecting the actual price, will not be re probably reflecting the fully this, uh, the whole tax increase, which is called uh, like uh, tax pass through to prices. And there are very interesting studies, uh, for example, Harding et al. Uh, it's a very good study. Uh, he showed that they showed that in the USA, cigarette taxes are less than fully passed through to prices. They also used uh, new consumer data, but for their early, like, early years. Kim and Lee, they used exactly the same framework, actually, like not exactly, but very similar framework to Harvard et al, and find that cigarette taxes are shifted significantly less to consumer prices in cities with large uh, minority populations. Uh, Xu et al uh, investigated how tax pass through differs between premium and generic brands of cigarettes. It's also a very interesting study uh, because these researchers were also investigating uh, different uh, price minimization strategies and the impact on tax pass through, uh, especially uh, when consumers were buying cigarettes in Indian reservations, where, as you know, the, you don't pay the state excise tax. Cho et al. also introduced a very interesting uh, uh, discrete uh, choice model to examine uh, state border crossing in the market of cigarettes. So, for example, they were considering uh, very interesting data where they were comparing uh, the prices, uh, the actual reported prices in tobacco use supplement with the average uh, cigarette price in the home, uh, in the state of residence, and uh, actually with the cigarette price in the lower tax state. So, all these uh, studies studies are very interesting and are uh, uh, clearly are the impact of uh, cross-border purchasing on estimated tax elasticity may be significant and it may bias the estimate of tax sensitivity. So uh, now let's uh, continue with the da uh, data description. Uh, it's actually a very, a very good data set. Uh, it's a Nielsen consumer panel data, which is uh, unfortunately not freely accessible, but it has very rich information. For example, our, uh, it has uh, all, all types of demographic characteristics, so various demographic characteristics. Also information on individual level prices, which are actual prices. Uh, also, which is very important, it has uh, address of residence of panelists at each point in time, so this will allow us to estimate border effects. And uh, of course, we have weekly purchase history of cigarettes and uh, all uh, possible like characteristics of, of like product characteristics as well, including UPC codes. Uh, now, uh, let's consider, so uh, at the beginning of my data preprocessing job, I had basically Nielsen scanner data is a transactional data set. I had around uh, more than 3 million uh, cigarette purchase transactions made by 52,000 households spanning from 2004 until 2019. 
And uh, since I wanted to do panel data analysis, I uh, transformed the transactional data into panel data by aggregating uh, the data to household quarter level. The frequency of the panel data set coincides with the frequency of historical cigarette tax data obtained from CDC that database. Uh, and the resulting panel data set comprises 378,000 observations of quarterly cigarette purchases. Uh, it also, of course, includes uh, demographic characteristics for each household and each uh, quarter, basically point in time, and uh, uh, tax rate in the, in the state, uh, including also geographic information. Uh, the most difficult and probably tricky parts uh, in the data processing are in the data processing was to estimate the distance uh, like uh, to the lower tax state border. And actually, for this purpose, I used our United States Census Bureau Tiger Line Shape Files, which is freely accessible. I mean, there is an R package, uh, which you can like download and use. And in this case, our, our, it, it is uh, like a good opportunity to, we can calculate, if you know, for example, zip code of resident, we can calculate uh, the distance from the household census tract residence to the border of the closest lower tax state. So the like uh, estimation procedure was uh, quite simple. So I identified the coordinates of boundaries for each U.S. state using uh, these shape files, and uh, calculated the distance from each consumer zip code to the state boundaries of every U.S. state. Then uh, I estimated the distance to the lower tax state for each time period and consumer zip code as the closest distance to the border of the state with the lower state cigarette tax. So in this case, uh, of course, I was uh, like, it was not like possible, I mean, feasible to somehow evaluate uh, the um, difference between uh, uh, state of residence and lower tax state and maybe construct a more complicated rule but in general what I was doing I was just for each uh, point in time each uh, zip code and each consumer uh, uh, like looking for like lower tax states so for, for the states with the lower uh, tax rate and uh, basically choosing the closest one which has the closest distance and saving the distance to the lower uh, tax state. Uh, since uh, we measure the distance to the lower tax state for each time period, we are able to properly capture the state and time level heterogeneity in cigarette taxes and the cost of cross-border purchasing. And in these uh, charts, I just simply illustrate the distribution of panelists, uh, which are uh, in the Nielsen dataset over your states. This is only panelists who purchase the cigarettes. They are mainly concentrated are uh, in the uh, eastern part of the uh, area, as you, as you see. Also, I was actually analyzing separately panelists residing near the border of a lower tax state, uh, which are like residing at 25 kilometers from the border, and the panelists residing far from the border as well. So this is a, just a distribution. Uh, now let's continue with the estimation strategy and estimation strategy is uh, very simple. So like what I did, I just took a regression specification, panel data regression specification, where I just regressed cigarette consumptions per quarter on excise tax rates and some variables which are related to border effects. These are distance to the nearest border of a uh, lower tax state, difference in the tax rate between a state of residence and lower tax state, and interaction term between distance and tax difference. Of course, I also included household demographic characteristics and individual and state level fixed effects. So this is a regression specification one, and then in the regression specification two, I used exactly the same model by without variables related to border effects. So it's mainly uh, tax in the state of residence, demographic characteristics, and individual and state level fixed effects. So our purpose is was to see whether the tax sensitivity or tax elasticity in these two regression specifications is statistically different. And it's indeed the case. So we observe that tax sensitivity in the model specification with variables related to border effects is larger than in the similar specification excluding these variables. And actually all the variables which are related to border effects are statistically significant. 
Uh, what is interesting, uh, I actually performed exactly the same uh, exercise among heterogeneous heterogeneous groups. So uh, the most important are uh, actually uh, uh, group which we need to consider is border residents and non-border residents. So border residents, I like defined like using very simple rules. So all the border residents which are living less than 25 kilometers from the border of the lower tax state are considered to be border residents, otherwise it's not border residents. And uh, for these two groups, uh, I estimated regression specification one. So the specification one with just panel data regression with demographic characteristics and variables related to border effects. And then regression specification two, which is a panel data regression uh, with exactly the same variable, but without variables related to border effects. And as you see, for border residents, the bias or so the difference between these two coefficients between estimated tax elasticity is very, very big. It's actually two and a half, five two, yeah, difference. But for non-border residents, the difference is not so uh, significant. Uh, I did the same exercise for different uh, like demographic groups. For example, uh, I identified heavy, average, and light smokers. In this case, I just by unique or, uh, for example, household IDs calculated what's a historical uh, average uh, quarter uh, cigarette consumption. And uh, for example, uh, the smokers which are on average consume more, for example, I defined in the heavy smokers group, the, the rest are from to average, and then uh, light smokers group, these are smokers which consume like small amount of cigarettes on average. And as you see, uh, the bias is also present uh, for all these uh, demographic groups. And actually for heavy smokers, the estimated sensitivity is larger. Uh, I did a similar exercise by uh, household income, uh, head employment, uh, and uh, also by education groups. And what we observe, actually, a very interesting observation that in general, low income unemployed consumers or consumers with uh, high school graduate or lower education, they have, uh, in general, higher tax uh, sensitivity of consumption. This is actually expected, yes, because if a consumer has a lower income, the uh, impact of, of tax increase may be more significant for these for this consumers. Uh, also, the same exercise was done by age, uh, so by different age groups, and we observed that their uh, bias is still present for these demographic groups by the presence of children and by gender composition. So uh, as a conclusion, uh, like, like of the estimation results, uh, we observe that the bias is particularly large for border residents. And uh, estimated elasticities are larger for the low income groups, are uh, higher tax sensitivity estimated for unemployed consumers and consumers without college degree can be potentially explained by the fact that on average these demographic groups has lower income. Uh, also, what is interesting are uh, I identified that estimated tax elasticity increases with smoking intensity. And even like when I was constructing these groups, I tried to actually uh, like or uh, have preserved all their like consumption history for each household. So, uh, and basically I was just grouping them by uh, on average over that sort of history, uh, how many cigarettes they purchased. So, uh, and what we observed that actually uh, uh, that for heavy smokers, tax sensitivity is much larger, which can be very like beneficial, yes, from public health so like view. Uh, this is actually also in contrast to the previous existing studies of uh, Lee and Coty, who show that heavy smokers uh, to a slight extent do not respond to excise tax policy measures. So uh, I think this is the first uh, course. So if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you, Aisha. I think before we move to our discussion today, uh, there is a Clarification question. So mm -hmm. what year was the data collected? You... Yeah, so the data was collected uh, for a large span, so from 2004 until 2019. Thank you. So I think let's turn to Catherine, our discussion today first, and then we'll address the audience questions later. Thank you, Thank you so much. This is a really fascinating talk. I just have a few questions. Um, 
my first question is sort of about other taxes. If I'm understanding this correctly, I think you're mm-hmm. looking at state taxes, state yes. cigarette taxes. Yes. Are you able Are you able to look at any of the sub-state uh, taxes and how that might if, how that might impact your findings? Uh, actually, this is an interesting question. Uh, in this actually study, I used only uh, state exi- excise taxes because um, I was trying to actually capture the state level heterogeneity and this impact of cross border purchasing. So, if in some excise ta- in, in some um, area uh, the excise ta- in, in some state excise tax is lower, so basically there is this border effect. But uh, of course, uh, there is this also a federal cigarette tax, which is common for all states, and also there are like different kind of uh, uh, of, uh, for example, geographical areas, uh, for example, Indian reservations, yes, in which you do not pay uh, excise taxes at all. So this is also one of the options kind of, of tax avoidance opportunities. Yes, this is one of the tax avoidance opportunities that should be also considered. But yes, in this particular study, I was concentrated only on state excise tax. Okay, thank you very much. And I had a, a, just a, quest, a couple of questions about your empirical specification. Um, I'm wondering what is the what roles do both the state and the individual fixed effects play? Because my sense is if you include both, are we going to be identifying? Yes, of- yes, yes, yes. So this is actually an issue which we were discussing a lot with my supervisor. Uh, the problem is uh, that. <laughs> Uh, I was actually estimating the specification uh, without state and individual level fixed effects because, as we know, they are capturing already this uh, individual level and state level fixed effects. Uh, these are heterogeneity, yes. So they are estimated separately to kind of individual intercept for each household or for each state. So, of course, in this case, uh, we are like the coefficients which are capturing in this uh, panel data specification, uh, they are capturing actually. Uh, a change uh, in dynamics. If some demographic composition for a household change, then uh, actually what will be the impact of cigarette consumption? And uh, like since we have it in a dynamic, uh, like dynamic panel model, uh, and we also can observe, yes, that uh, for around 30% of our panelists, they also either change state of residence so they are distance to the lower uh, tax state changes in time for around 30% of observations, which is actually good and beneficial for me. Uh, and this means that either taxes in the lower tax state changes or either they change their place of residence. So in this case, we can more or less interpret this distance or, and uh, we can more or less interpret the, like for example, this uh, border effects variable as well. But in the sense that like, yes, these demographic characteristics, they are just showing how consumption will decrease in when some uh, like uh, demographic or for example variable will increase for example presence of children when we have observed for example that household is having children then uh, how this consumption of cigarettes will respond to this and actually it's also very interesting observations what we, uh, for example I observed from the data panel data regression is that for example yes it's uh, also uh, consistent with the existing studies so if we observe that uh, a household is having children then the consumption is cigarettes is decreasing so yeah but uh, I understand uh, your concern and actually I estimated this specification without uh, individual and state uh, fixed effects as the problem was in this specification are uh, actually some of the coefficients on some demographics they were um, uh, they didn't have like proper economic intuition so it was like for few of them but the magnitude and uh, on average like the estimates on the border effects variable and on their uh, tax they were actually the same approximately the same so i also like presented these results in appendix great thank you so much uh, just two quick questions and then and then i'll um i'll let you pr- continue uh, my first question is, did I miss it or do you have time fixed effects in the regression model? And then my second uh, question is, uh, this, uh, this panel data, I think it's uh, a model is sort of um, uh, an extension of a, of a basic difference in difference estimator, uh, which uh, a common uh, rec- a necessary assumption is common trends. That's more challenging when you have these continuous treatments, but have you thought about how you might um, provide some suggestive evidence on the common trends or sort of the additional assumptions that one might be required to call upon with uh, this continuous treatment and the uh, two-way fixed effects regression? 
Uh, yes, so you haven't missed it. So in this <laughs> regression specification, yes, I have not included time fixed effects. Uh, because, yeah, my concern was that probably in this case, uh, uh, I would really eliminate like all possible like heterogeneity, especially like this uh, change in excise tax and time, which can be then very tricky to estimate. But this is a very interesting question, actually. And uh, we were discussing this with supervisors. So they basically are uh, looking at this uh, two way fixed effects. But in this, uh, like in this, like particularly in this case, yes, I, 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 I was not looking at time fixed effects because I was thinking, okay, since I'm already like accounting for state and individual level heterogeneity, if I already account for time level heterogeneity, and I'm already, for example, my purpose is to investigate this time variability in excise taxes, then uh, maybe I would like get into troubles because yeah, but uh, this is a very interesting question. I, I I I probably would consider it in my future research. And uh, uh, of course, yeah. So thank you for your suggestion. Thank you, Aisha. Uh, we have several questions from the audience. Uh, the first question is regarding the uh, threshold of twenty-five kilometers that you used. So uh -huh. to define border residents. So, so how was that determined? 25 uh, <laughs> It was just a judgment. Uh, so probably uh, it was some kind of a threshold when you find your costs of traveling to the nearest low tax state not so high. Uh, uh, Plenty but control. yeah, it was just 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 a cutoff point, and uh, in general, also for example, when we see further in our robustness check uh, exercise, it was kind of more or less uh, plausible th threshold when we continuously excluding border border residents uh, and like looking at their uh, evolution of uh, our tax elasticity. So like looking at these kind of observations, I just identified this cutoff point. But yes, it's kind of not as scientifically driven. So uh, it's just like a judgment based on the observed pattern. Yeah, I think it would be interesting to do some sensitivity analysis using different uh, distance. Um, okay, so there are other questions. So Stan Glenz asks, was the only significant difference in coefficients between close and far border residents, uh, the tax elasticity? That's what the numbers look like. I think what he's trying to ask if you can go back to your slides where you present, uh, you know, uh -huh. the, uh, elasticity estimates, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I guess the question is about whether the uh, border, uh, I guess by border you see differences, whether that's the only significant difference that you see uh -huh. uh, compared to, you know, other stratifications you have here. Uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. Can you comment on that? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in general, of course, the largest uh, difference and the largest bias would be for border residents. But when we just, for example, concentrate on different heterogeneous groups, uh, we observe that this uh, bias uh, is present uh, for all uh, demographic groups. So this is our estimates. Uh, I think a more detailed uh, table I have uh, also in the working paper. But the like the outcome is that uh, we observe like the same bias and the same magnitude. So in general, like in specification one, their estimated tax elasticity is uh, larger than in specification two, uh, mainly due to our uh, actually uh, cross border effects, the influence of cross border effects. Yeah. So I think if you report the standard errors, it'll be more clear. Um... To, to tell whether yes I reported actually I think in the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah um, another question from Stan so thing. what fraction of smokers live near borders in your analysis do you know do you have that information what fraction of smokers live near borders in uh, I have this information so I can if you give me one minute I can quickly check exact numbers yeah sure so and he also mm -hmm. sorry 
Yeah, just just one second. I think I have it here. So both the residents, they were 53,000 observations and uh, residents are far from the border. It's for 324,000 observations. So it was around yeah, this percentage. So like 20, 20, uh, 30 percent, I would say. Yeah, so yeah, he also has a follow up question regarding mm -hmm. the number of varies by state. So the fraction is like uh, this. Uh, this are uh, definitely are uh, it will vary by state because uh, we have a different concentration of our panelists in the states so depending on how many panelists are like represented in the in the data set or uh, of course we will have a different or uh, like like concentration but actually this is a valid point so this this actually i haven't checked our uh but uh, it, it, it can be, uh, uh, of course, included in, in the paper, so. So one last question before we move on. So what is the, re uh, what is the retention rate of household? I.e., how long does the average household remain in the panel? And then it's around, it yeah, yeah, it's around like a strong, uh, from an average from three to five years. So uh, in general, of course, it's not a balanced panel. So the households are, for example, reporting for some years and then exiting it. So we don't have a continuous observation for all like uh, 15 years, unfortunately. But in general, yes, this is kind of a pattern of, of, of the households. Yeah. It's not a balanced panel, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Okay, so any investigation as whether this retention rate is uh, systematically related to taxes? And I'll uh, just... Uh... Uh, most probably uh, not, because uh, of course, uh, in this case, uh, it would be also useful to see, uh, like, but I really, for example, didn't have time, uh, that sometimes households uh, may, may disappear from the sample simply because they quit smoking. <laughs> yes, so they have like a zero consumption and they're not already presented as a data set. Of course, in this case, uh, like it was, it, it is an important observation to like keep them in the sample and just to trace uh, like uh, these observations as well. Uh, so maybe in this case, it can be affected by, by taxes, but uh, in general, of course, it's not affected by taxes, but we have like all this uh, like large sample of like uh, around like 20 million observations. Uh, and uh, this is just uh, like their purchases uh, through time of all types of consumption products. Uh, I'm, I'm just concentrated on cigarettes. Uh, and I was only looking at the households who are smokers. So they have non-zero consumption of uh, cigarettes. Thank you, Aisha. So please continue. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> so uh, let me uh, then go to the last uh, like uh, and very interesting part of, of the presentation. Uh, this is a robustness analysis. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, uh, like I wanted to do some uh, like robustness check, and to ensure that uh, like the like preliminary estimates of the bias and what we observe in the data are are uh, like also robust, and that we can have some kind of a very, also a clear evidence. So as a robustness check, uh, I wanted to ensure that tax sensitivity are uh, in a state of residence uh, in model specification too, so without border effects on average uh, exhibits a decreasing pattern when we subsequently remove households residing near a lower tax state uh, border from the estimation. So in general, I did a very simple exercise. Uh, I start with the whole population sample. I estimated my regression specification too, so that, and also the tax elasticity of cigarette demand for each demographic group. And then uh, further, I was subsequently excluding uh, border residents residing less than five, then up to like 50 kilometers away from the border and was reestimating the tax sensitivity for aggregate sample and for each uh, population group. Uh, and uh, what I was expecting to see, I was expecting that uh, the estimated tax sensitivity should gradually uh, 
like increase yes so it's, since it is negative yes uh, like apparently it should show this uh, gradual decrease in pattern when we subsequently exclude uh, remove households from the sample uh, the decrease in pattern of the negative coefficients on the home state tax implies that the cost of cross-border purchasing increases uh, with distance to the lower tax state border. Therefore, the tax sensitivity estimate gradually converges to the unbiased estimate when border effects are eliminated. Of course, we also need to take into account very important fact that when we are excluding border residents, subsequently, we are excluding also a big portion of our sample, and probably uh, the impact from the sample decrease may sometimes uh, like outperform yes, the impact from uh, cross-border effects. Uh, but in this case, it's still a very useful exercise, and this is uh, uh, these are results on aggregate sample, as you see uh, on this chart. Uh, uh, the error bounds showed uh, the bounds of 95% confidence intervals. Uh, uh, I was actually estimating at the point zero, so kilometers from the border, the model specification to an aggregate sample. Then I was excluding all border residents that were living five kilometers from the border, then re-estimating again tax sensitivity and the whole regression specification. And I did it like 10 times subsequently and uh, like like trying to observe whether I have really this uh, decreasing pattern in tax estimate. And in general, what we observe is that indeed uh, this pattern is present. So we can see that there is a really like a gradual increase of tax sensitivity when we are subsequently uh, by small portions uh, exclude uh, border residents. So uh, in this case, uh, we can like more or less uh, confident, confidently confirm that the border effects indeed are affecting estimated uh, tax sensitivity of uh, consumption. Uh, the same I did for different demographic groups. So, for example, by middle, uh, by income, are uh, and by employment status, we observe that uh, for the households with low income and uh, unemployed consumers, very similar pattern when we perform this exercise, which is a bit surprising. But one potential explanation can be that the impact of our uh, like uh, like increase uh, of sample, of gradual decrease in sample, in this case, is outperforming actually are the impact from border effects. This can be one potential explanation because otherwise it is very difficult to economically justify it. But for example, for middle income, especially for middle income and high income consumers, we still observe this uh, decreasing pattern, uh, gradual decreasing pattern. And also this is the same for employment status as well. Uh, for head education, so everything is standard, so I actually did the same exercise by head education, we observe this decrease in pattern, so we gradually remove households uh, from the border, like border residents, and uh, the tax sensitivity is uh, gradually increasing. The same by household age, so we can see even more steep pattern, especially for the households which are lower than uh, younger than 35 years old, which is also more or less plausible because our younger consumers are for them also the cost of like traveling to nearest uh, lower tax state is like lower years. Uh, and uh, are the same for gender. Uh, again, for example, are like from my sample, uh, unfortunately, for example, are the largest sample size is for uh, households with female and male head. So for that, we can see a very nice relationship for gender composition with male head and female head only. The sample size is much, much smaller. So that is why probably this uh, are, are impact from decreasing sample size uh, again, like outperforms uh, border effects or uh, uh, influence. And uh, we observe the same for smoking intensity. It's very interesting to see that, for example, for heavy smoke, how sharply it decreases. And uh, for heavy smokers, the estimated tax or sensitivity is much, much higher, for example, than for average smokers, which is actually in contrast, in contrast to the existing studies. And uh, uh, for light smokers, of course, because these smokers, they consume a very small amount of cigarettes on average, uh, the, the body effect is not so significant, but still we can observe some decrease in pattern, but it can be mainly driven that 
in general, the impact will not be so high, of course, simply because uh, they are not consuming a large amount of uh, cigarette packs. And as a conclusion, uh, like what I wanted to like again summarize, are uh, like I found that both effects create a bias in the estimate of tax elasticity, which is present for all demographic groups. Uh, the bias is particularly large for both residents, and we, this is what we observed in the data set. So basically, for these uh, groups of uh, for this demographic group, uh, their tax policy measures are not very effective. So local tax policy measures. Also, uh, we analyze how the consumer response to a cigarette tax increase uh, varies between households with different uh, demographic compositions. Uh, we observe higher tax elasticity for the low income group, higher tax sensitivity estimated uh, for unemployed consumers and consumers without college degree can be potentially explained by the fact that on average, these demographic groups have lower income. And uh, what is like one of the important findings that uh, I identified that estimated tax sensitivity is statistically significant for heavy smokers and it's actually much larger, for example, so potential decrease in cigarette consumption for heavy smokers uh, to in response to one dollar increase in tax is much larger, for example, than for light smokers and for uh, average smokers. And it increases actually, so it increases with the smoking intensity. And this finding can be beneficial from the perspective of potential public health implications. Also, uh, unlike to the previous existing studies, who show that heavy smokers uh, do not respond to excise tax policy measures or respond to a slight extent. So, uh, do you have any further questions? I would be happy to respond. Uh, I think we'll save all the questions to the end, since you only have two slides left. Do, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think we can we can save uh, the question to the end. Do you have yes, a so the last two slides are just uh, references. So I think, okay. yeah, it's already the okay. end of the presentation. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Then it's time, uh, I guess, uh, to see whether we, our discussion today, have any uh, questions and comments. Thank you. Oh, great, thanks so much for this really uh, fantastic talk. I just have a couple of quick questions then we can get to the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, one was a, a bit of a technical question that I had earlier um, but didn't have time for. How do you handle your standard errors? How are they, how are they calculated? Are you clustering at the state level? Yes, so basically uh, I use uh, uh, just so uh, available software package and I use state and our individual level fixed effects and I use fixed effect estimator. So our, this is our, our, and state actually level fixed effects are uh, represented as dummy variables in my regression specification. So in this case, it's just different intercept for each state. And also like individual fixed effects are represented as a fixed effect estimator. So are um, in general, yes, as are a standard estimation of fixed effect with uh, state level dummy variables. In, in this case, yeah. So our, um, it's not a random effects model, so it's a simple fixed effect model with this uh, standard representation of individual level fixed effects. It's not a two-way fixed effects model as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and oh. I was wondering, um, in, uh, in the survey, do you have any information that would allow you to maybe estimate pass-through rates for the different groups or maybe try to look at the types of cigarettes that they're purchasing to kind of understand um, of course, how these may differ? Of course, yes. I was not concentrated too much on the pass through rate uh, because it was already done uh, like in previous studies, maybe not in a very detailed extent, but still are uh, there were like several studies uh, I was showing like in the literature reviews that, that were invest in, in investigating this pass through rate among different demographic groups. Uh, they were actually looking, uh, like they had like different research designs. So they were looking at transactional data set, and we have in the data set actually the actual purchase prices. So it was just a regression, panel regression on the transactional data, and uh, probably are uh, I'm not sure because the frequency of the transaction is quite different. But since we're looking at prices, it would be probably fine. Um, um, 
but yes of course it is possible to look uh, at their like uh, actual reported prices so we can trace actual paid prices and to estimate like tax pass through for different uh, demographic groups but uh, in this case i wanted to look at some different direction just uh, because i know that there are already some studies which were investigating this topic it's a very interesting topic <laughs> and your second question sorry could you please <laughs> um i think i was just wondering if you had any information on um, the products uh, the characteristics yes the yes this is up. Yes, this is actually our, we have it. Uh, it's present in the data set. That is why our, it's actually very amazing data set. So uh, we have uh, UPC codes, UPS, UPC codes. So we can track actually all product information and also all the product information is present in the data set, including nicotine content, tar content, and all these kind of quality characteristics. So this is actually my second working paper on which I'm working on. <laughs> right. uh, because yeah you you can really track uh these quality characteristics and you can really track for example like, like at least share of high tar and low tar consumption in response to excise tax increase and this is present for the data set for each transaction so our uh, yeah we have it i mean this data set it has it great that sounds like a future paper wonderful uh, thank <laughs> you very much that, that, that i really thank enjoyed you. thank you thank you thank you so much Thank you. So there are several audience questions, uh, questions from Mike Pesco. So how is the analysis showing heterogeneity by smoking intensity done? Is smoking status determined at the baseline period to avoid concern that taxes could affect smoking intensity, thus causing the stratification by endogenous variable? Yeah. So how yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is actually our True, yeah, this is, <laughs> so of course, uh, we know that we cannot cluster by endogenous variable uh, simply because then we will like, it's kind of, you cannot make a truncation by endogenous variable. But uh, in this case, I, I really just really wanted to see uh, at least by smoking intensity, uh, and I was trying to construct as robust variable as possible because I was looking at the individual level in, in the, in the, at the individual household. So basically by household ID, I was just aggregating all like cigarette consumption during the whole observation history, which is approximately from three to five years and calculated what is the average backwater consumption of this uh, household. And in our kind of air, uh, model, we are still looking at number of cigarettes consumed at point in time. And maybe it can serve as a like additional caveat, but I agree that uh, in this case, our, we should not like group by like variable by, no, it's not a dependent variable because our, it's just something which is a feature of the household over the whole observed history, but uh, it's still very much connected to the dependent variable. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good observation point. Uh, but in this case, still, it would be interesting to see at least by smoking intensity, by at least like this kind of feature, like for example, smokers which smoke a very small amount of cigarettes on average during the whole like five years history, how they respond to our like tax change. Okay, so there is a, a, a comment from Stan Glenn's. Um, he said it would be interesting to see that effects on a state by state basis, since in some states more people live near the border than in others. So uh, you know, he also thinks you have the data to do that. Uh, yes, this is a research uh, idea. Do you have any? <laughs> you <should have> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, actually, our in this case, uh, this is a very uh, useful comment. Our and our, uh, of course, our we have this kind of state level heterogeneity, <laughs> and we have this state level variability of taxes across state, which can be very significant, like from fifty cents to five dollars per pack. But uh, um, uh, this would be another regression specification. Of course, in this case, we cannot include, for example, state fixed effects. So this this one, I would probably also maybe investigate or, or uh, in the future. Um, um, 
yeah but uh, this uh, i have I, I have data for this and i have already like even prepared modeling data for this this all this information yeah thank you so i'm gonna combine three audience questions because i think they are related uh so from lisa uh she has a question regarding other potential means of tax avoidance for example uh, people, some people, smokers would uh, switch from cigarettes to cigar, cigarillos to uh, cigarillos to save money. So that's a, a way of uh, alternative tax avoidance. Um, and also, uh, there is a question regarding black market, so illegal cigarettes. Can you comment on those other tax avoidance uh, behaviors, and can you observe that in your data? Uh in the data, most probably it is difficult to observe, uh, but uh, or, I mean, especially black markets. So I think what can be done, uh, maybe if we have some information on the tax legislation for each state, and maybe also some information, it would be very useful, like about like black market, like percentage of black like cigarette markets, yes, or like, for example, one of the tax like avoidance opportunities is their purchasing in uh, Indian reservations as well. So of course, if, uh, for example, our, like we will do some further investigation whether we will have uh, this state level information on the share of uh, like illegal cigarettes or on the share of, for example, uh, availability, for example, like or opportunity to buy uh, like cigarettes in uh, uh, tax-free areas, for example, such as Indian reservations. So uh, this can be uh, potentially incorporated in the data set because in the data set, which is very good and it's kind of very beneficial, we have zip code. So we can track and we can track it's like changing in time, uh, like exact coordinates of the resident. So, and uh, in, in, in general, our, it can be done, but it should be like, uh, of course, uh, taken from from other like uh, data sources, data sources, uh, and especially, of course, are uh, like, for example, in the future, like uh, probably uh, we need to do some research uh, on the like this state level aspects. But it would be really nice data if we would have it like this kind of the shares of like uh, illegal cigarettes or like yeah or some other so, factors which are uh, actually uh, may uh, create this tax avoidance. And of course, uh, one of the tax avoidance uh, opportunities is also stockpiling. And I think in this uh, model, or we can somehow create or uh, actually a uh, more or less robust estimate of this stockpiling impact as well, because. Yeah, I think the audience is also interested in learning whether we can see the transition from, for example, cigarettes to mm -hmm. uh, Cigarillos to save money. Yeah. So that's the way. Yeah. Yes, <clears throat> of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Of co <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. So uh, there is a question from uh, James Prager. Um, he wants to know how did you calculate uh, the actual elasticities? Uh, it appears you only refer to the slope coefficients in a linear linear regression. So the coefficients are partial derivatives, but not elasticities. Uh, wouldn't your conclusion when you have a smoker having higher elasticity change if their coefficients were derived by using prices divided by consumption or quantity to make them elasticity? Their, their quantity of consumption is larger than others by definition. So if you want to look at this question, you can click q and A. I think it's a very interesting econometrics question. <laughs> yes, uh, actually, it's a very interesting question. So, of course, uh, this is a valid observation. I was, yeah, honestly looking just at very simple panel linear model, or uh, fair, yes, it's just uh, estimated using like. Oh, like some simple model, like of course in panel data case, it's a generalized method of, moment, of moments, but like uh, even OLS, ordinary least squares will work and it will like, provide approximately the same estimate, but maybe not efficient. Uh, yeah, and of course in this case, since it's a linear regression, this elasticity is very much connected to the like like consumption, like in, in intensity, as it was also stated uh, by Mike. So, uh, 
this is a valid question. So thank you for your suggestion. I think uh, it would be really good to, to also maybe consider it in my future research. So yeah, consider it from a different perspective. Thank you very much. I don't see any additional audience questions. Uh, thanks very much. I really enjoy your talk. Uh, so <laughs> thank you so much. I am see Mike. Uh, this up. Thank you. Thank you. We are out of time. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 130 people for your participation. Have a top snatch weekend. Thank you very much. <laughs>